Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Your Health Matters. I'm your host, Dr. Peter Hogenkamp, and today we're going to be discussing, we're going to continue to discuss how we age successfully. Um, for those of you who saw last uh, month's program, um, we talked about um, activity as being central to aging successfully. And, and as a reminder, I wanted to say two things. Number one is, if you did mass, uh, miss last week's episode, all of the episodes are available on the um, uh, PEG TV um, YouTube station. Just look up PEG TV YouTube station, uh, Your Health Matters, and it'll pop right up. Um, so if you did miss, please go back. Uh, it was a great program. I've had a lot of good um, uh, <clears throat> compliments about it. And um, the second thing I wanted to remind you of is what is the definition of, of successful aging? Well, I'll kind of recap last week's program just to, um, you know, just to kind of bring us up to speed. So successful aging, again, by the definition that, that is generally used uh, by medical folks and, and the one I'm using today for sure, uh, is not just living long, it's living well. Uh, it's living a long life, but also a good life with lots of uh, quality. And <clears throat> the secret to doing that is to stay engaged in your life. And last week we talked about staying engaged in your life um, in a physical sense. Um, as one of my patients tells me, motion is lotion. Um, and I want to use that as a, uh, a reminder to say that a lot of the things that I'm talking about today, I have learned from my patients um, over a 30 year career. Uh, I was told in medical school one time that um, if you just sit down and shut up, your patients will tell you everything you need to know. You can learn everything you need to know about life and medicine if you just sit down and shut up and listen to your patients. So, so for the patients I've talked to for many years, um, uh, thank you very much. And um, to, to just kind of briefly talk about last week, you know, we were, we were talking about exercise, physical activity, and all kinds, and how important that is. Because if you want to age successfully, you need to stay engaged physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially, um, and intellectually. And um, there's a lot of overlay between a lot of these things, but that's how you successfully age. That's how you avoid disease and illness. That's how you, um, you say um, uh, having great cognitive, mental, and physical function. That's how you stay um, <clears throat> psychologically adjusted well in life. These are all some of the definitions that people use to uh, kind of give a measure of successful aging. And so today we're going to talk about a couple other things. We talked about physical engagement last week. Now we're going to talk about um, social engagement. We, today we're going to talk about social, intellectual, and spiritual engagement. And I, th I think not only are they important, but they're kind of fun as well. Um, and this is a great uh, way to bring up the, my uh, plug that um, enjoy life, um, uh, stay engaged in life, participate in life, don't just sit down and watch TV. Okay, so let's start off here and talk about um, how to stay engaged in life socially. Um, before we do that, I want to say, tell you why we should do that. Um, and the first reason is that medical studies show um, that not only do people who stay engaged in life socially have a, a better quality of life, but they actually live longer as well. Um, and remember, we talked about successful aging as being both um, uh, long longevity and um, you know, good quality of life. So staying um, involved socially actually helps you out on both of those issues. And keep in mind that everybody is different. Um, I've got patients who are introverted. I've got patients who are extremely extroverted. But just because you're introverted does not mean that you uh, can't participate in life socially. Um, you just have to be, you know, uh, do it a little bit differently. You know, um, a lot of times people think about social engagement. They think, you know, going to big cocktail parties or large concerts or dinner parties. And, and those are certainly social engagements. However, they are not the only ones um, 
by any means. And I want to give you some tips today on how you can stay engaged socially as well. Um, so the first one uh, would just be volunteering. Uh, you know, I have a practice. I bet my average age of my patients is probably 70, 75, somewhere in there. And a lot of these folks are retired. And as a consequence of their retirement, they have more time. And a lot of them volunteer, and I hear from just about every single one of them how fulfilling it is. Um, it, it means a lot to them because one of the things we have to keep in mind is, as people is that we do better when we have a purpose. And so when you are retired and you're no longer working, sometimes there's a void there. Uh, and I think volunteering is a great way to fill that void. Um, number one, it's social. You're seeing other people. You're talking to other people. You're learning from other people. Um, you're also kind of giving back to your society. All these things tremendously improve your quality of life. They help, help you age well. Uh, so how do you volunteer? Well, a lot of them, um, my office is right across the street from the hospital, so I suspect that um, uh, most of my patients, uh, in, in living in, uh, in Rutland, where I do, um, you know, where the, we have uh, an excellent hospital um, with a thriving volunteer program, uh, that is uh, one good way to get involved in volunteering. Uh, it's <clears throat> You can stay active. And the other thing about volunteering, um, and, and many of these things we're going to talk about shortly, they have overlays into other areas of engagement. Uh, for instance, volunteering uh, in the hospital, people walk a lot, so that you know, involves you know, staying in, in, uh, physically active in life. So there's a lot of overlay between these things. Volunteering at the hospital is wonderful. It really is. Um, a lot of these folks come back and they tell me, gee, I walked 10,000 steps today in my, in my volunteering. They're helping other people out. They're seeing other people. They're learning from other people. So volunteering at the hospital is one idea. Um, volunteer at the library. Read books to kids. Um, volunteer um, as an elder care worker. A lot of my patients do this as well. Um, my dad, uh, I talked about my dad in this program a number of times. He was a huge influence on my life. And uh, although he died 20 years ago, um, you know, I still think about him all the time and uh, you know, try to learn from him. Um, even though he's been passed away for so many years. He uh, had a big job in his life, and it got to him, and he started having some health issues. So he retired early at 60 years of age. And retirement was great for him in a lot of stamp from a lot of standpoints, but from some standpoints it wasn't. Um, he kind of lacked purpose. And so he went out and on his own, and he found a number of elderly people in his community, um, and he just basically started looking after them. Um, it, it wasn't through any type of program, um, although there are a lot of programs that you can get involved in. Um, he just found people uh, that needed his help, and he gave it to them. Uh, he would take this, uh, this lady shopping. He'd mow a lawn. Um, you know, he would go over and, um, and kind of do little odds and ends. He wasn't handy at all. The man couldn't even screw in a light bulb. <laughs> but but he, t you know, he, he would find someone that could. You know, and, and so... I remember um, uh, he got so involved in this one lady's life that um, you know, when he left, uh, this was down in Florida, when he left to come back up to the, um, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the north for the winter, for the summer rather, he was, he was very concerned about this lady's welfare. But it added so much to his life, it really did. And it was a social thing for him. Um, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful. Remember now, being engaged socially not only increases your quality of life, but studies have shown that it actually increases the length of your life as well. Um, so we can volunteer. Wonderful thing. The, the next thing is just plain old work. Um, I have a, I'm a physician, as, as you all know, and you know, it's a wonderful job in terms of my social interaction. Uh, but you know, at some point I'm going to retire, and you know, I, as a, you know, everyone generally does, and I often encourage my patients, hey, go get a part-time job. Go get a part-time job because working is a social thing. You know, obviously, dependent upon what you're doing. If you're a fire watcher in the, in the middle of the uh, uh, Northeast Kingdom, that's probably not a social job. But out, outside of that, most, most jobs have a social component. And they also, you know, they, they, they pay some extra money. For a lot of my retired folks, the extra money can be, go a long way towards their quality of life. So that's good as well. So, so don't forget about working um, as a, a, a means for um, increasing your social activity. Sports. We certainly talked about sports last week uh, when we talked about um, you know, keeping your physical activity going, but sports is a great way to socialize. Um, when I was a kid, um, me and my buddies from high school, we formed the Sons of Ireland, which was a social athletic club. 
And we are running in this race uh, called the Boilermaker. It's a, a race that's uh, run annually um, in Utica, New York, where I grew up. And we all had these t-shirts printed out, like the Sons of Ireland Ath uh, Social Athletic Club. And um, we were, uh, as we came in very close to last, <laughs> the Boilermaker, and we got, we got on the news because uh, we were running across the street with these Sons of Ireland t-shirts on. And uh, anyway, one of my buddies got interviewed by the, by the uh, uh, news, and they said, to, uh, they said, well, tell us about the Sons of Ireland. And uh, he goes, well, you know, as we, as we came in close to last, you can tell that um, you, uh, our, our, our club is more of a social than an athletic club. But the point remains, th thank you, Dr. Paul Costello, for, for telling me that many years ago. But the, uh, the point remains that sports are a great way to socialize as well. Um, I love to golf. And there's so many things I love about golf, but probably the number one thing is, is I'm seeing my friends. And um, we get on the golf course, we goof around, we catch up with each other. You know, we, we, um, uh, it's just a, it, it's a lot of fun socially. It's, it's a great social experiment. And unfortunately, I have to ruin most rounds of golf with, with many, many bad swings. But still, the overall experience is wonderful because of that social aspect. Um, but golf is not the only um, uh, uh, sort, uh, sport that's social. Tennis. Um, I'm going to put a plug in for here for pickleball, which is you know, sweeping the country. Uh, pickleball is a great sport. Uh, it's certainly kind of like modified tennis. Um, it's still very um, um, uh, athletic and physical, uh, but it's certainly uh, doable for all ages of folks. And again, you're bringing people together. Anytime you bring people together for whatever reason, it's a social activity. Um, bocce. A friend of mine does bocce. Uh, and although we have arguments about whether bocce is a sport or not, um, it's bringing people together. Shuffleboard. Frankly, I don't really care what it is. Um, I'll call it a sport for the, for, the, uh, uh, for the sake of let's get people together, let's get them to be interacting socially because it's good for us. It helps us age successfully. Um, what other sports can I think of? Uh, swimming. Um, I, I'm not a big running fan. We've talked about this before because I think it's uh, destructive uh, uh, to, the, um, to the joints. And I think the overall effect of running on somebody's health, especially as they get older, is probably negative. And, and the other thing, running is more of a solitary thing. Um, but um, uh, the next thing I wanted to mention is hobbies. Um, I have a patient who has a wonderful hobby. He, he does radio flying airplanes, and he gets together with people um, all the time. And they share this passion for this, for this uh, hobby. He, he goes to conferences. Um, he travels and, and goes to various meets and things like that. It's wonderful. Um, cards. Uh, I would be remiss. My mother would be mad at me if I didn't talk about bridge because my mother, <laughs> my mother is always talking about how wonderful bridge is. She has been one of the great joys of her life. She's played bridge <clears throat> many, many, many years, continues to play bridge even, even now that she's 93, although she's playing less these days. Uh, but she's played, uh, you know, it's a social thing. They're getting together. I remember um, uh, growing up, um, my mom used to have bridge club at the house. And we would come home, and there would be chips, there would be soda, there would be brownies, things we never had growing up. We, we didn't have these things in our house except for special occasions. And um, uh, you know, most modern households have these things in them all the time, but we only had them for special occasions. And bridge club. And I remember trying to sneak into the kitchen um, and to grab some of the chips. Uh, and you know, my mother would only let us eat them once all the ladies had left. Uh, but one time I ate a couple brownies before bridge club, and I got in big trouble about that. I'll, I'll, I was probably 15 at the time. Um, but bridge club uh, is a great social interaction. People get together to play cards all the time. It doesn't have to be bridge. It can be hearts. It can be canasta. It can be cribbage, 45, um, pitch, which is also called setback. Just uh, cards are wonderful. Um, and the, we're going we're to talk about card playing when it comes to staying intellectually involved as well. Um, gardening clubs. Uh, these, these are wonderful things. Gardening is not only um, social. Uh, it can be social if you're in a gardening club. It, it's also obviously physical. It's also... In, in many ways, artistic and creative. We're going to talk about creativity um, helping you age well as well. Um, so these are the things, um, th those are just some suggestions for you. Um, if you have any others, please let me know. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, by the way, just to um, uh, mention this, uh, peterhogancampbooks at gmail.com. That's peterhogancampbooks at gmail.com uh, is my um, uh, email. 
and, uh, or get on my website at Peter Hogan Camp Books, hit the contact me form, give me some ideas. Um, let me know how you stay engaged socially. I, I, I love these ideas. Again, all these things that I'm mentioning come from my experience with my patients and my family, and I'm sure there's others. Uh, uh, dog shows. Um, my father-in-law used to, um, uh, not the most social man, but the social engagement that he did have was with his dogs, and that was a big important part of his life. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities out there for social engagement. They're good for you. I want you to seek them out. I want to talk next about intellectual engagement, intellectual engagement. And, you know, I kind of lumped in intellectual and academic engagement in the same thing. The first thing that you need to do is, outside of watching uh, Your Health Matters on PEG TV, is you need to turn off your TV. Um, I remember my mother um, talking about the boob tube when we were growing up. This boob tube is the worst thing going. Uh, and you know, she used to just say that. It used to annoy me as I was trying to watch one of my favorite shows. For instance, The Lost in Space. I used to love that show. But um, <clears throat> she was right. And as we look at um, all this um, uh, <clears throat> information that comes out in medical studies now about television um, and being passive in your life, just sitting there and watching something, and we realize how bad it is for you in terms of dementia and things like that, turn off your TV. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely crucial. Um, you know, again, I, I tell this to parents all the time. How, you got to limit your, screens, uh, your child's screen time. You should be doing the same for yourself. If your idea of, of spending time is just sitting behind the TV all day, you know, you are putting yourself at risk for dementia. You are not going to age successfully. Um, just keep these things in mind. Um, so what do you do instead of watch TV? And the answer is the first thing that comes to my mind Read, read. Reading has been shown um, to decrease your risk of dementia. It uh, it's a wonderful way to successfully age because you, you're, you're staying in involved in life intellectually, especially if you choose um, you know, uh, certain books. You know, there are certain books that, that um, really um, uh, stimulate your thinking, get you to think about new things. The, these get your mind active, get that, that muscle, that your brain, get it working. Um, and now the, the brain is actually not a muscle, but I talk about it like it is a muscle all the time because I think it helps us uh, when we talk about using it, you know, exercising it. Um, so that's, that's how we do it. We read, and reading things actually, um, uh, as I mentioned, several studies have shown that, that it decreases your risk of dementia. The more you read, the less likely you are to, be, um, uh, to suffer dementia. None of my patients want to get dementia. This is one of the things I've learned from sitting across the room from patients for 30 years. It's almost everybody's biggest fear. And if it's your biggest fear, turn off the TV, pick up a book. And as an author, I, <laughs> I think it's wonderful that people read, and not only my books, uh, but everyone's books. And uh, there's so many wonderful authors out there. Um, I really encourage you to read. Um, most, more recently, I've been reading a lot of uh, more nonfiction. I've never really kind of read much nonfiction in my life. And I've read some wonderful kind of books um, I've mentioned before that um, a, a, a good book is enjoyable. A great book changes the way you think. Um, and there are three books I kind of want to just mention right offhand here. Number one is The, um, uh, the Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert, who is a wonderful author. Um, Elizabeth, a, a fairly local person. She lives down in um, the Berkshires in uh, Massachusetts. Read The Sixth Extinction. It'll change the way you think about the world. Um, Sapiens. Uh, by Yuval Harari, which is an incredible book. Um, we should all be re uh, reading that. And um, uh, The Vatican Conspiracy by Peter Hogenkamp. Uh, that will change the way you think. Um, so, read. The other thing is, and I, and I, in Vermont here, we have a wonderful vibe of creativity. And I really think the Green Mountains, the beauty of the Green Mountains, there's something in the air here that, that makes uh, Vermonters a creative folk. Um, and it is very, very clear um, that people who create uh, age well. They now, uh, because it is probably one of the most powerful things that you can do to stave off dementia, stave off cognitive decline, and that is to create. So, um, in, in Rutland, we're blessed with many painting studios. We have a, n a number of wonderful local painters um, who have their works uh, um, uh, being um, displayed here in town. There are painting studios where you can go and, and you know, take courses in painting, or you can just go and paint. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Express yourself. 
when you create, you're really kind of opening up new avenues of your brain. Um, that's been clearly shown with, with studies with, um, with PET scans and things like that. Go create. Um, and I'm going to give you some, some ways to create. Write. Um, as a writer, I, I think um, uh, you know, it's one of the, been one of the most um, enjoyable parts of my life. I really felt like I've learned a lot about myself writing. And you can write in many ways. Uh, blog. Journal. Um, journaling is a great, we're going to talk about spiritual health shortly, um, and um, journal is a great way to, to keep up spiritually, believe it or not. Um, um, dance. Dance not only is, um, uh, opens up your creative mind, um, it also is obviously athletic. Quilt. Uh, I um, have uh, so many patients of mine who quilt, and they, it's a wonderful thing because well, many of them do it together, so it's a social thing. But it's also a way to stay engaged socially because um, uh, it's also you know, a way uh, stay engaged with your grandchildren. Um, my mom made quilts for all of her granddaughters at one point in time, which was a wonderful thing. Um, there are many, many ways. Write poetry. Draw. Um, these are all ways to express yourself creatively. You are expanding your brain. You, you, not only is your brain not shrinking, well, you know, if, we think about, uh, if we think about dementia as kind of like, sh you know, your, um, Cognitive, decline, your cognitive um, capacity declining. Think about creativity as your cognitive capacity increasing. So if there's one thing that you take away from this program today, go out and create something. Create a garden. Um, you know, create, uh, create a beautiful, beautiful meal. Cooking can be creative. All these things expand your cognitive capacity. And, and that's what we're trying to do here with Successful Aging. We're trying to expand our cognitive capacity. All right, um, learning. I mentioned last week that I had an argument with my dad many years ago, and I told him that when, you know, if you stopped learning, you might as well, you, what's the point of going on? And um, I really believe that to be true. There are a, a couple of points I want to make in, in terms of statistics. One of them is that the more educated you are, the less likely you are to suffer dementia in a linear fashion. Um, so the more educated you are, the less likely you are to suffer dementia. So that does not mean that if, if you don't have a higher degree of education that you're going to get dementia because, as I mentioned, successful aging is an intergenerational thing. It means that people of all ages can make decisions that help them um, age better. You can do it when you're 5, you can do it when you're 10, you can do it when you're 75. So if at 18 you decided not to go on to higher education, which is fine, now that you're 75, you can still choose to go on to higher education. There are classes available at community colleges. There are classes available for seniors all over the place. I, I'll uh, mention a program that um, I was exposed to in medical school. My medical school did a, pro, uh, did a mini medical school for, for senior citizens. Um, and I don't remember the specifics of it, but I think it was about a month long thing where they went and had the professor from the medical school go ahead and basically put these people through a kind of a mini medical school boot camp. Um, there's all kinds of programs like that. If you, don't, if, you, uh, if you don't know of any, get on your computer, tap, 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 and you know, type in you know, uh, learning uh, programs for seniors or, or you know, for fun. There's all kinds of programs. The Cooperative Extension um, does all kinds of uh, programs like that. There are um, uh, one of my favorite people, um, Dr. Ed Callahan, who's my um, uh, professor of English in, um, uh, at Holy Cross. I, I've written about him extensively. He was a wonderful man, and he was a great, great um, mentor for me, and, and, and you know, he was really just a good influence on my life. But anyway, um, I did write a blog about him. If you're ever interested, um, uh, uh, go to Peter Hogan Camp Writes, which is the blog that I keep and um, search for the, the one about Ed Callahan. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. Ed, after many years of teaching at Holy Cross, he went on to teach courses at the elder hostels. So he would um, go to these places and people would travel to these places and um, uh, you know, they would not only um, travel and, and sightsee and things like that, but they would also, uh, they would also um, take classes from Ed. And I, I, it's wonderful. When you learn, you're expanding your cognitive capacity. Remember now, we're, all, we're fighting this shrinking uh, cognitive capacity. But by learning, taking classes, um, creating, we're expanding that capacity. Um, teach. Teach. Teaching is a great way to, um, uh, to age successfully. You know, you don't think you can teach uh, anything? I bet you're wrong. 
I bet you can teach someone to play cards. You can teach someone to play the guitar, piano. You can teach someone to garden. Um, you can teach somebody, a, a grandchild, a friend, um, how to quilt, how to sew, how to crochet. Teaching is a wonderful way to age successfully. I want to go, um, we only have a few minutes left here. I wanted to talk about um, um, engaging with our lives spiritually. I think this is a very, very important way that we need to stay engaged with our lives. And I think it's one that's, that's often overlooked. I want to just mention something. When I talk about this, people always seem to um, confuse spiritual engagement with religious engagement. They certainly can be the same. Um, uh, there are a lot, 43% uh, of this country um, self-reports as being engaged religiously and with various communities. Um, but in addition to being engaged religiously, which is fine, um, you can also be engaged spiritually. Everyone can do it. Because being engaged spiritually meaning, is trying to find meaning in life. Um, it's trying to find the value of our existence. Um, it's about connecting with ourselves first, with others, um, and with nature. Um, it's finding the greater purpose in life. You know, why are we here kind of thing. Um, and lastly, it's, it's about, you know, kind of communing with and discovering nature. So when I'm talking about spiritual engagement, you know, it certainly could be religious services or, or some type of religious commitment like that. It doesn't have to be. Um, I know a lot, a, a great friend of mine, um, on Sunday mornings, um, he, he grew up going to church, and, but as he got older, he kind of moved away from his, uh, his faith in that way. But he would go out and take a, a nature hike every Sunday morning, and he always used to take, you know, the, that, that bald mountain was his church. And, and that's a lesson well learned, I think, um, because that's, it can be very spiritual um, communing with nature. And again, what is spirituality? We're, we're trying, to, trying to find meaning and value in life. We're trying to connect with ourselves, with others, and with nature. Um, uh, I mentioned volunteering is a great way um, uh, to practice spirituality. Um, again, you're, you're, when you volunteer, you're doing something for other people. And as a consequence of that, you are, you're, you're trying to find the meaning and value of life. You're, you're looking for the greater, the greater purpose. Um, I think yoga uh, is a wonderful, wonderful way. My son is a yoga practitioner. Um, he has a very active and thriving yoga practice. Um, and I think um, it's uh, done a lot for him in, in many ways. Um, meditation, mindfulness. I, I'm, I did once, um, uh, I haven't um, done a lot with meditation and mindfulness personally, um, but I certainly have uh, had many, many patients talk about them. And, you know, what are you trying to accomplish when you meditate? Um, you are trying to accomplish the same thing that you do with any type of spiritual endeavor, and that is you're trying to find meaning and value in life. You're trying to find the greater good. But lastly, you're also, it's also about becoming. I love this whole idea of becoming. Um, becoming, in, in short, means looking to, to, to grow um, and find the progression in life, to progress in life, to grow in life. And I think um, uh, yoga especially is a wonderful way to do that, as is any, any form of meditation or mindfulness. We, we, uh, I want to get to a couple last things. Um, journaling. Journaling is actually a spiritual activity. Um, I've said this before um, uh, in my blog, again, on Peter Hogan Camp Writes, if you're interested. Uh, you know, the, the most important thing about writing is that it's, it, it, it's self-discovery. That's why I have loved blogging, you know. Just Choosing a blog to write about tells you a lot about yourself. Like, wh why did I choose to write about this? This must be important to me. I, I frankly can't imagine anybody that doesn't write to some extent because it's, it's such a, a good way to discover who you are. And if that isn't spirituality, I, I don't know what is. Um, so journal. Take, uh, a friend of mine for my, uh, uh, my 40th birthday bought me a leather-covered journal. And although I have never written in it, that got me started writing, um, and I have now published three books and written a total of five. Um, so, you know, that's just, an, uh, just goes to show you that just some little act of somebody that does for you on, on, on a birthday can have this big effect on your life. You know, it's like, keep in mind now how we're, we're so involved with each other and the decisions and things that you say can mean a lot to somebody else. Think about that all the time, because that's important. Um, 
lastly, nature. Um, going out in community nature is a wonderful thing. We'll talk about that more next week. Um, uh, I have run out of time. Once again, I very much appreciate your, um, your participation today, your, your, uh, uh, your tuning in, and we'll see you next week where we're going to talk about the effect of diet on aging. Cheers. <laughs>